Please join me in welcoming to the stage John Breen, um, who is the Georgia Reithel Professor of Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. He earned his BA from the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame, <laughs> Notre Dame du Lac, right? The original, um, and his JD from Harvard Law School. After clerking for Judge Boyce F. Martin Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, he practiced law at Sydney and Austin in Chicago before beginning at Loyola. He has written extensively on Catholic legal education and is currently at work on a book on the history of Catholic law schools in the United States. Please join me in welcoming John. Uh, good evening. Um, as Michael said it, my name is John Breen, and it's my, my great pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, tonight to this Lumen Christi event and to serve as its moderator. Um, a panel discussion on Father Bill Miss Campbell's recent biography of Theodore M. Hes Hesburgh, entitled American Priest, The Ambitious Life and Conflicted Legacy of Notre Dame's Father Ted Hesburgh. Um, before I go on, uh, there are two items I'd like to, uh, business items. First of all, if you're looking for wireless access, they have some cards out, out front uh, at the uh, reception area where you can, um, you can gain access to the Scatton Arps uh, local uh, wireless network. Um, and the second item of business is, uh, before introducing the panelists, uh, I'd ask you to please join me in publicly thanking uh, the Skadden Arps Law Firm uh, for hosting this panel discussion in this wonderful space and the reception that will follow. Uh, Lumen Christi and everyone in attendance is truly grateful uh, for your contribution. <laughs> now, <clears throat> there's an old joke that people who enjoy, enjoy poking fun at Notre Dame alumni like to tell. How many Notre Dame graduates does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer, 100. One to screw in the light bulb and 99 to reminisce about it. <laughs> now this joke takes aim at the penchant that many Notre Dame alumni and alumnae have for recalling with fondness and in sometimes nauseating detail nearly every aspect of their Notre Dame experience, whether mundane or truly outstanding. Be it the particular traditions of one's residence hall, the challenge of studying for demanding classes, the fun of bookstore basketball in Antostal, the peace of a late night visit to the grotto, or the food at the north and south dining halls, the experience is deemed to be special simply because it's Notre Dame, and so necessarily carries with it some of the glow and shimmer that radiates from the Golden Dome. The joke find its, finds its mark not only because Notre Dame graduates make for easy targets, but because reminiscing is a self-indulgent and frequently maudlin exercise, an activity best reserved for football weekends and class reunions. Remembering, on the other hand, is an altogether different exercise. To remember is necessary for life, and to not remember is to live the unexamined life that is not worth living for a man. Indeed, for an individual or society or an institution such as a university, to not remember, to not examine history, is to live in an endless present without understanding and to drift into the dull tableau of dementia. So it is good to remember. Better still, it's good to remember, to look back and examine, with an eye that is at once appreciative and critical of its subject. That is plainly the goal that professional historians set for themselves and what Father Bill Miss Campbell aimed to accomplish in his book on the life of Father Ted Hesper, a book that is neither a hatchet job, as some have described it, nor a work of hagiography. Cleanly written, it is instead a complex account of a complex man and we hope to explore some of that complexity tonight. The individuals who will lead us in tonight's discussion are as follows. First, the book's author. The Reverend William D. Miss Campbell is a Catholic priest and member of the Congregation of the Holy Cross. A native of Australia, Father Bill was educated at the University of Queensland 
and the University of Notre Dame. And just to be specific, not Notre Dame, Australia, Notre Dame in South Bend. He served as the rector and superior of Moreau Seminary, the principal formation site for the Holy Cross Order in North America. Father Miss Campbell is a professor at Notre Dame's Department of History and a former chair of that department. The author of four books, his primary research interests are American foreign policy since the Second World War, the role of Catholics in 20th century US foreign policy, and in American public life. Bill Cavanaugh, who's on the end uh, of the podium, or of the dais, is professor of Catholic studies and director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University. He's a 1984 graduate of Notre Dame and has his master's and PhD from Cambridge University and Duke University, respectively. He's the author of seven books and the editor of four more. He is married and has three sons. Jennifer Mason MacWard, who's in uh, just to um, Bill's uh, left, is an associate professor of law at the University of Notre Dame and the director of Notre Dame's Clow Center for Civil and Human Rights. A former law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, Professor MacWard's research interests include the power of Congress to enforce constitutional rights as well as the work of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Next to Jennifer is Ken Woodward, who was for 38 years religion editor at Newsweek magazine. He's the author of four books, including his recent book, Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Ascent of Trump. He personally knows or knew virtually every person mentioned in Father Bill's book, American Priest, and he is also, I know, uh, a proud Notre Dame dad. Uh, with that, uh, we hope to have a rousing yet respectful discussion, waking up the echoes with respect to Father Hesburgh's remarkable life and legacy. Uh, we'll begin with five minutes of introduction, uh, opening remarks from Father Bill, which will be followed by each of the other speakers going for 10 minutes, and then we'll open up uh, the, uh, the floor to questions. Father Bill. Thanks very much. Dear friends, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Thomas Levergood and Michael Bradley and all the other members of the Lumen Christi team for organizing uh, this event. And uh, a special thanks to uh, these members of the panel whom uh, John has just introduced, for agreeing to reflect upon and engage uh, my book. It's the best an author can ask from anyone, although good sales of the book would also be nice, to have people actually read it and uh, engage the book, whether they agree or disagree. I want to give special thanks to Jen because she, of course, had to make the trek in from South Bend on this uh, rather misty day. But uh, also, uh, I appreciate, of course, John's, uh, we've known each other for a long time with our interests in Catholic higher education. And of course, uh, Bill Kavanagh, who was with us at Notre Dame uh, last semester, whom I got to listen to and learn from, and especially to Ken Woodward, uh, I owe Ken Woodward an intellectual debt that's obvious in uh, some parts of uh, my book from his own writing about Catholicism and about Father Hesburgh. And of course, I want to thank each one of you in this uh, room. It's a sort of uh, rectangular room. I'm beginning to think I'm in that downstairs lecture room of the Center for Social Concerns at Notre Dame. I'll have to keep my long neck moving back and forth to keep you in some sort of eye contact. I certainly am so grateful to look over this room and to see former students, the parents of former students, uh, to see actually some couples whose weddings, <laughs> weddings I presided at. Uh, it's a great sight looking from here. Pity you all can't be up here right at this moment. Uh, but also, I see friends from various stages of uh, my own journey. And this book was in some ways written over different stages of their journey and reflects something of it. 
Now, those of you familiar with Notre Dame know that Father Hesburgh is pretty much lionized on our campus, and uh, with good reason, given his incredible leadership of the university over 35 years. As you know, uh, a number of buildings and programs are named in his honor, and uh, in that usual modest Notre Dame way, some folks think that Father Ted has not indeed been honored enough at this point. Indeed, uh, Jen and I were on a panel recently and uh, we were laughing about, well not laughing, but uh, about the possibility of Father Hesburgh at some point maybe even being canonized uh, in the future. Uh, this sometimes occurs after folks see the recently released documentary film, Hesburgh, directed by Patrick Creedon, if I have his name correct. And I should add that both Jen and Ken are significant contributors in that film. They have featured among uh, the many individuals paying tribute to Father Hesburgh. But I want to suggest that before we rush straight to the hagiography stage in our writing about Father Ted that we examine his life with some care. And this is what I have tried to do in American Priest. And that is, I believe, what that uh, amazing American priest would have wanted me to do and told me that he wanted me to write a serious history about him. All those years ago, back in 1998, when he and I were gathered at Lando Lakes in Wisconsin, I interviewed him over a series of evenings late into the night. Uh, we talked in terms of my trying to write a full life. So of course I waited until his own death of course, he lived a long life. I wasn't concerned at any point that he might outlive me, but uh, as he kept going, the thought occasionally entered my, my head. But uh, anyway, he, he said, approach my life as a, as a historian. And that's what I've tried to do with the limits on the uh, materials to examine that uh, in existence at the moment when uh, lots of archival files and so on are still, of course, closed and will be for 30 years. If you want something approaching an exercise in hagiography that certainly leans in a hagiographical direction, I would recommend the film, Hesburgh. It's so beautifully done, it moves along smoothly and well, and I encourage you uh, to see it. But if you're prepared to wrestle with a more complex life, then I ask you to look at my book. Those who think of Notre Dame as a sort of mere brand to be promoted and protected may not be enthusiastic about some of what I have written, but those who understand what a real Catholic university is, I believe, will welcome it. They understand that we're engaged as best we can, given our human limitations, in the pursuit of truth and a richer understanding. Now, my book examines Father Hesburgh's contributions across his long life. Following his ordination in June of 1943, Father Ted recalls that he stopped by the east door of then Sacred Heart Church, now Basilica, and read the dedication above the door, God, Country, Notre Dame. And he recalled that right there he committed his life to serving what he called that trinity, that trinity. And he kept that pledge. He poured out his energies to serve his nation and his church and to build up the university with which he was integrally linked for over seven decades. His remarkable life and notable contributions make him unquestionably 
the most significant figure in the modern history of Notre Dame, and probably only rivaled by Soren in the long history of Notre Dame. My book, as I say, examines his contributions, and we want to assess his legacy with care and with a recognition of the larger context in which he operated. When examining Hesburgh's portrait more closely, the sort of glowing picture portrayed in most general commentary about him, and is certainly reflected in the documentary, I think becomes a bit more blurred, and the exact nature of his accomplishments more debatable. I see George there. Great to see you, George. While the aura that surrounds Father Hesburgh, especially at Notre Dame, makes it somewhat difficult to criticize his actions and inactions, the historian's task is not to simply burnish the image of a charismatic individual, but rather to examine a mortal life in its complexity. Father Theodore M. Hesburgh possessed a powerful belief that he was meant to lead Notre Dame to greatness as a Catholic university. He was blessed with endless self-confidence and a zealous energy, and he utilized eff uh, which he utilized effectively in performing his leadership role. And he possessed good measure of those qualities of vision, courage, etc. But I suggest to you that in addition to those wonderful qualities, Father Ted possessed a strong compulsion to break free of the restraints of those whom he judged might thwart his ambitions, his desire for greater independence from his religious order and from the institutional church certainly shaped how he led the university. And ironically, while separating himself off somewhat from those groups, he developed a virtual dependence upon the regard and esteem of the liberal establishment in America. This partially concealed but very real craving Ken Woodward helped me appreciate this, imposed fetters of a different sort on him. He personified the push for assimilation and acceptance in America, just as notably as did JFK, his near contemporary. They were born four days apart. And his membership in the American upper echelons came to mean a great deal to him. The desire to be part of the elite circles of power and influence colored how he led Notre Dame as well as the causes he pursued. He especially sought the regard of the higher education elite for his university and his leadership of it. But this recognition and regard came with a cost, as will be evident to all who have the energy to trace the story I tell in my book. I leave you with this question. Might it even be said of him that he did perhaps too much kneeling before the world? Thanks so much. Well, I want to thank uh, Lumen Christi and Father Bill, especially for this wonderful book. In addition to having Father Ted's signature on my diploma, I did two tours of duty as a Holy Cross associate in Colorado and Chile. Uh, I've done two sabbaticals at Notre Dame. I thought I'd heard every story there was to tell about Father Hesburgh, but I learned a lot from this meticulously uh, detailed book. A few of my favorite moments, the, um, the discussion about the Kennedys kind of putting the brakes on civil rights, uh, Father Ted writing that you can play Notre Dame students like an organ. I thought that was really interesting. And my favorite is Richard Nixon on his knees in the confessional in Sacred Heart Church, <laughs> pretending to admit his sins. Um, 
Father Bill has written a gutsy book. It's both an appreciation and a critique of Father Hesburgh, and it's something that only someone who loves Notre Dame and loves Father Ted uh, could have written. Combining love and critique of Father Ted is nothing new, as anyone who's hung around Notre Dame can tell you. As students in the last years of Father Ted's presidency, uh, we revered him, but we also poked fun at him. Uh, the following news item appeared in a student-run publication during my senior year in 1984. Quote, if I don't do something quick, the whole thing's going to go kablooey, explained Father Theodore Hesburgh, throwing his arms above his head and making guttural exploding sounds. Hesburgh was in town this week to explain his motivation for inviting Konstantin Chernyanko and Ronald Reagan to a bake-off to settle their differences on the nuclear arms issue. Father Hesburgh will be on campus again next weekend to preside at the second annual Doggone It, We Gotta Do Something About This Nuclear Thing conference, featuring some of the most distinguished members of Phil Donahue's studio audience. <laughs> the conference, whose theme this year is Total Nuclear Holocaust Would Be a Very Bad Thing, will be held in Sacred Heart Church. The back rows of pews have been reserved for the chairman of Exxon and the rest of the university's board of trustees so that they may giggle and make snide comments." End quote. Uh, yes, I wrote that. I was a smart ass as an undergraduate. <laughs> um, it reflects something of what is in Father Bill's book, Father Ted's absences from Notre Dame, his naive op optimism, his boundless self-confidence. The joke, uh, one of the jokes uh, is that he would say, well, as Jesus once said, and I think he's completely right about this, and then he'd go on. Um, I came away from the book, however, realizing that I need to do penance for my youthful, jaundiced view in the present context of deep cynicism or the idea that people get into politics to serve the public seems laughable. There is something refreshing about Father Ted's earnestness and altruism. And in fact, with regard to the specific issue of Hesburgh versus Reagan, I was dissatisfied with Father Bill's presentation of Father Ted as naive and soft-headed and Reagan as the realist who brought communism to its knees. In my view, Hesburgh was right to oppose Reagan's saber-rattling, his ginning up of fear of the enemy, his large military expenditures, his targeting of non-combatants with nuclear weapons, his support for the slaughter of tens of thousands of peasants in Central America in the name of Cold War politics. In the 1980s, Reagan was selling American vulnerability before the fearsome Soviet evil empire, despite the fact that the whole thing was about to collapse like a house of cards. And so as I see it now, it's the people who bought Reagan's story and not Hesburgh who were naive. Uh, there's something we can argue about, Father Bill. <laughs> Nevertheless, I recognize Father Bill's portrait of Hesburgh, who is a man both supremely confident in his own abilities, yet insecure about the place of Catholicism in higher education and in American society more generally. Father Ted undoubtedly thought that Catholicism had something important to bring to the life of the mind and society more broadly. What exactly that something was, however, was not clear to me as an undergraduate at Notre Dame. The prevailing ethos emphasized nurturing Catholics' faith on campus and then getting them into positions of influence once they graduated. A holistic Catholic vision of the world was something that one might cobble together from the rich resources available at Notre Dame, but in general, departments were more intent on meeting the standards set by secular colleagues in their own disciplines and moving up in the rankings and the rage for rankings has gotten much worse since then. The secularization of Catholic higher education proceeds apace. And I think uh, Father Bill is right to be concerned that most Catholic colleges and universities since the 1960s have paid little attention to hiring Catholics or articulating through the curriculum anything like a coherent view of the world formed by Catholic intellectual traditions. Whether or not that failing can be laid at the feet of Father Hesburgh, however, is a more complicated matter. It is true that Father Ted was a key figure in Catholic higher education when the transition began in the 1960s, and one can hardly fault Father Bill for concentrating on Hesburgh's role in a biography of Hesburgh. Some broader context, however, would help fill in the picture and nuance the impression that Hesburgh is to blame. 
what was Notre Dame like before Hesburgh took over? Well, my impression from older alums is that they were force-fed catechism and manual theology. They came away from Notre Dame with a deep cultural Catholicism, but not a coherent synthesis of the Catholic intellectual tradition. The broader cultural context is crucial as well. Hesburgh and Notre Dame have been swept along by a much broader movement of Catholic assimilation to American culture, and now by increasing defections from the church. Those defections have been accelerated by the actions and inactions of the bishops, especially with regard to the sex abuse crisis. Do we really think that Catholic higher education would be better off if the bishops had close oversight? Father Bill is deeply critical of the transfer to lay control, but supervision from the Vatican and the bishops comes with its own set of problems. Perhaps the biggest complicating factor for the narrative that Father Bill tells regarding Hesburgh and secularization at Notre Dame is that Notre Dame today, in my judgment, is in better shape with regard to Catholic identity than any other Catholic university, uh, in, maybe in the world. I have taught at two other Catholic universities, and Notre Dame is light years ahead in fostering a Catholic culture on campus, creating programs that deal with Catholic themes, and making a deliberate effort to hire Catholics. The goal is to keep Catholics over 50% of the faculty. I love DePaul, but it's quite possible for a student to spend four years there and never have any contact with Catholicism in any form. Outside my department, which is Catholic Studies, any Catholics found on the faculty there are there by coincidence. In many departments at many Catholic colleges, being Catholic would be an impediment to being hired. And, and, and I mean that absolutely seriously. Um, that's, that's not exaggeration. Notre Dame is in much better shape, and I think Father Hesburg needs to be given some credit for this. Of course, there is more to being Catholic than just having Catholics around. The ultimate criterion is faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father Bill's book is critical of Father Ted's assimilation to American liberalism, but less critical on his assimilation to the ethos of American conservatism. Father, Notre Dame under Father Hesburgh relentlessly pursued the goal of getting Catholics into the American establishment. And this included the full embrace of the American military and the culture of American corporations. The goal was to, uh, to have Notre Dame graduates commanding nuclear submarines and directing multinational corporations. And that goal has been achieved. Whether this has been a victory for the gospel is not so clear. Catholics would change the world by getting into positions of power, but power has a way of changing the people who wield it. Having practicing Catholics around is a necessary but not sufficient condition for having a truly Catholic university. The deeper and more troublesome question is whether or not Christ is being followed. So when Father Ted says, I would dedicate my life to that trinity of God, country, and Notre Dame, I think we should be uneasy. The deification of country has been a sore temptation at Notre Dame as Catholics have longed to enter the American mainstream. So the problem, in other words, is not just assimilation to American liberalism, but to America. So I look forward to arguing with Father Bill about this. Uh, before we get to that, though, I want to thank and congratulate him once again on this essential biography of a great priest and for opening up a necessary conversation on the present and future of Catholic higher education. Thanks. You'll have to bear with my voice. Uh, if you can't hear, raise, raise a hand. Okay, is that better? Oh, good, okay. Um, Bill, you mentioned um, canonization. Um, I happened to write a book on that um, called Making Saints. I happened to have a conversation with Ted, and uh, you can appreciate what, uh, when I tell you that he um, wiped his hands together and said, "Well, we we got canonized. We uh, we got Brother Andre canonized, and now we got to work on Soren." It was not a matter of when, but just simply working and getting it done. That's what I call can-do optimism. First, how's it going? I'll let you know later. 
Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Bill Miscandle on his new book. Publication, I've always thought, is the closest thing to childbearing that we men can experience. <laughs> there are two things about American priests uh, that are easy to overlook, but for which I especially want to thank him. First, his insight that Father Ted went to sleep every night convinced that the decisions he had made that day had the approval of Our Lady and the Holy Spirit. That single line tells us a lot about Ted's piety and his self-assurance, plus his unsuspected connection with another famous president who always slept soundly after making important decisions, Harry S. Truman. Second, Bill, is your inclusion of Ted's short but absolutely devastating critique of the famous but fat, uh, of, uh, of Mario Cuomo's famous but fatuous speech at Notre Dame in 1984 on abortion and Catholic politicians. The fact that Hesburg first softened him up by calling the speech brilliant typified his knack for lowering a person's guard then hitting him in the ego, which is where Cuomo lived. <laughs> I can say that with confidence because I had numerous conversations with Cuomo about that speech before and after he gave it, much of them recorded in my own book, Getting Religion. Now, as for Ted Hesburgh, my life was mortised into his starting in 1953 when I entered Notre Dame where my older brother already was a student. It continued during my early years as a civil rights reporter when his identification with that cause did not sit easily with the university's white, upwardly mobile, mostly conservative alumni and donor base. I met Ted numerous times in New York during my Newsweek years interviewed him dozens of times, attended one of his Catholic education conferences at Lambda Lakes, and visited him frequently in his retirement, the last time uh, with conservative Wyoming Republican Senator Al Simpson, um, less than a year before he died. When my wife Betty traveled for Save the Children, Ted supplied her with phone numbers she might need when, she le when he learned that she would be visiting dangerous parts of the Middle East and Latin America. He spent the night once in our home, breaking bread at our table, first at dinner and again at, at, uh, at the mass he celebrated on the same spot the next morning. My children all met him on their own. My sons graduated from Notre Dame, my daughter, like Betty, from St. Mary's. I've seen him eloquent and I've seen him sputter for words. I've seen him work a room better than most politicians and I've seen him flustered. But I have to tell you, Bill, that I never met the man you describe in your biography as the liberalist establishment's, quote, accommodating and acceptable priest. End of quote. I speak now as a writer and editor as well as a reader of texts. In general, what I find in American priest is a recurrent tension between the main narrative flow in an undertow of ideological accusation. Not surprisingly, the issue of abortion and how to respond to it figures importantly in your book. As you yourself observe, Father Ted was not a demonstrator. He worked for civil rights, but he did not march with Dr. King. He worked for peace, but he did not march against a war. He opposed abortion, but he did not march for life. He subscribed to Cardinal Bernardine's consistent ethic of life, and you, it would appear, do not. On abortion and related life issues, Hesburgh preferred working with people he disagreed with rather than shaking a fist at them. A classic example, which American priest overlooks, is the global conversation about population control to which even the Vatican sent a delegate. This is in the 60s into the early 70s. At the time, Ted was on the executive committee of the Rockefeller Foundation, which had long supported methods of population control that Ted disagreed with. Thus, when Rockefeller, Planned Parenthood International, and other entities paid for a 20-article supplement on the subject in the New York Times, 
Father Ted was able to argue against both abortion and state mandated population controls, writing, quote, to redeem the times and the population problem as well, we must redeem sex. To make it once again the language of love, of generosity, of children responsibly and lovingly begotten, end of quote. No bishop or cardinal was positioned to do that, which is one reason why Ted refused offers of ecclesiastical advancement. Who needed the hassle? The difference between your tactics, Bill, on abortion and Ted's do not, I think, justify the following conclusion you reach about Hesburgh's motives and moral character. Page 288, quote, to speak on abortion would have put him at odds with so many of his friends in the American establishment, with the Rockefellers, with Bob McNamara at the World Bank, with Mac Bundy, who was then heading the Ford Foundation, it was not simply a concern about putting at risk the personal status and acceptance he had won. He represented Notre Dame and his university was in the midst of striving to improve and to build its reputation as a modern American university. To speak out on civil rights brought favorable recognition to Notre Dame from the people who mattered most in academe, the media, and the foundations. But abortion was quite different. What might they think of Notre Dame if its leader had stood to the fore of the pro-life movement? End of quote. In a word, Bill, you're saying that Father Ted Hesburgh was a toady. This is not, on my reading of your text, a conclusion reached by argument or evidence, but it is an assumption you begin with. But it is not, for all of that, a judgment you do not prepare the reader for. Across your many fine pages of historical exposition, this reader noticed a slow drip drip of acid asides and interpretations of scenes you did not witness or source. For example, when Ted is told that he is to be the next president of the United States, I mean of Notre Dame, he could have been the other one as well, um, you write, quote, that he did his best imitation of Uriah Heep. End of quote. That's intentionally pejorative. Time and again, we are told that Ted, quote, basked in the presence or praise of this or that secular celebrity or authority, thus giving a cumulative impression of a man whose vanity needed nourishing and who was therefore susceptible to flattery. I think not. Early on, I think he learned that they needed him more than he needed them. Even toward the end of his life, when Ted is blind and relies on student volunteers to read him the New York Times, you add this condescendingly ideological sneer, quote, which he still thought of as containing all the news that's fit to print. That's a line only Sean Hannity could love, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm also bothered by stories you tell that leave a wrong impression, and I'll mention just two. No sooner do you tell us that Father Ted lived in a small room in Corby Hall overlooking a dumpster, than you add that one in New York on business with the Rockefellers and other members of the liberal establishment, although there were a lot of very billionaire Republicans in that liberal elite, um, he often stayed in a suite at the Commodore Hotel. The unstated argument being that he lived extravagantly when on the road. In fact, the Commodore was a very ordinary hotel down the street from Newsweek that had seen better days. And if the suite was corporate owned and maintained for use by visiting board members, lodging there saved Hesburgh from expensing the university. In the same vein, Twice the book tut tuts Ted for spending his Christmas breaks with the families of two wealthy friends on California's Baja Peninsula. What it doesn't tell us is that during those vacations, Father, celebra Father Ted celebrated mass for the workers there, mostly Mexican immigrants, did it in Spanish, 
or that with the financial help of his Protestant hosts, he had a chapel built for them as well. Ted Hesburgh had profound pastoral instincts, something he discovered working with veterans and their families before he became a university president. Did he make mistakes? Of course. But he took risks. Above all, he dared to dine with sinners and even invite some of them to come to speak on campus. There is, I believe, a powerful Christian precedent for that. Thanks. It's an honor to participate this evening, and thank you to Lumen Christi, and congratulations to Father Miss Campbell. I direct the Clow Center for Civil and Human Rights at Notre Dame, which Father Ted founded. Because of this institutional connection, I've had occasion to study Father Ted's work on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, and I use that research as the basis of my reflections this evening. While Father Miss Campbell quite rightly states that Father Ted was a tireless advocate for civil rights, I want to push back on the book's assessment of the, quote, modest impact of Father Ted's civil rights work. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the importance of Father Ted's moral leadership, his policy leadership, and what I call the leadership of personal connection. To answer Father Miss Campbell's question that he posed at the conclusion of his remarks, in the realm of civil rights, Father Ted did no kneeling before the world of the powerful but he did kneel before the weak and disenfranchised as a servant leader. At the outset, it's important to understand the theological framework that formed the basis for Father Ted's views on civil rights. For him, the crucial starting point was the sacred nature and God-given dignity of the human person. From this reality, he argued, should flow the conviction nihil humanum mihi alienum, translated, nothing human is alien to me. According to Father Ted, if each of us truly held this conviction, then every instance of human suffering and foreclosed opportunity should affect us deeply and compel us to work to remedy the great inequalities and injustices of our time. Father Ted held his convictions about human dignity even prior to his service on the US Civil Rights Commission, but it was his 15-year tenure on the commission from 1957 to 72 that gave him the opportunity to learn directly about the suffering experienced by racial minorities in this country. He consistently gave public voice to the moral outrage of racism during his time on the commission and thereafter. As the book points out, it is of course true that Father Ted's was not the only voice that framed racial discrimination as a moral issue. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. provided consistent moral witness, and other Catholics, clergy and lay, and other people of faith participated in the civil rights movement. But while we have a clear understanding today of Dr. King's righteousness, we must recall that during the 1950s and 60s, he was reviled in many sectors of society. The FBI covertly surveilled him as a national security threat from 1955 until his assassination in 1968. In 1964, when Father Ted stood with him at Soldier Field, captured in a photo that Notre Dame uses so often, Dr. King was viewed unfavorably by 57% of the public. By 1968, his disapproval rating had risen to 75%. To have a white Catholic priest appointed by the president speaking on behalf of a federal commission, articulating a moral critique of racism, enabled that message to be heard even by those who discounted Dr. King. It is regrettable that that is the case, but it is true. Indeed, as Andrew Young, a close confidant of Dr. King, once observed, quote, 
The key to the success of the civil rights movement was to keep it from being a radical leftist movement and to recognize that it was truly a movement coming out of the Judeo-Christian US constitutional tradition of justice. Well, nobody could represent all of those forces like Father Ted could. Expressing a similar sentiment, President Jimmy Carter noted that because African-American activists during that era were often marginalized, they were in dire need of, quote, very distinguished white leaders who would join with them and add imprimaturs of approval for what they were doing. Father Ted was one of those who came forward, end quote. In addition to providing an important moral voice against Jim Crow, Father Ted also proved himself to be an important policy leader. Father Ted took his seat on the US Civil Rights Commission in 1957, three years after Brown versus Board of Education. Despite Brown, the vast majority of public schools throughout the South remained segregated, and Southern political leaders called for open resistance to integration. Mississippi chose to close its public schools rather than to integrate them. Georgia simply issued a resolution asserting that the 14th and 15th Amendments to the US Constitution, which guarantee equal protection of the laws and voting non-discrimination, were, quote, null and void. Against this background, the commission held extensive hearings on resistance to Brown and theorized that where moral suasion and judicial mandates had failed to promote integration, financial incentives might work. Indeed, Father Ted became the leading proponent of promoting integration through the, through the threat of withholding federal money. He initially proposed this idea in the commission's 1959 report in a joint statement joined only by two other commissioners. Two years later, the entirety of the commission adopted Father Ted's approach. And most critically, Father Ted prevailed with Congress, which passed Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, permitting the government to cut off federal financial assistance to any program that discriminates on the basis of race. More than anything before it, Title VI had an immediate and beneficial effect on school desegregation in the South. And it was Father Ted's brainchild. Operating on a national stage, Father Ted demonstrated a savvy ability to translate his moral vision into operable policies. Indeed, by the end of Father Ted's tenure on the commission, including nearly four years as its chair, Congress had enacted roughly 70% of the commission's recommendations, incorporating them into critical pieces of civil rights leg legislation, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, with respect to voting rights, Father Ted was both a policy leader and an advocate for individual citizens. When Father Ted began his tenure on the commission, intimidation and disenfranchisement characterized the state of the African-American vote across the South. State and local officials used literacy tests, poll taxes, and outright physical violence to suppress the black vote in what Father Ted quite aptly described as, quote, a reign of terror. The commission's work ultimately formed the core of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, especially with regard to the abolition of poll taxes and literacy tests. And Father Ted, of course, participated in formulating these influential policy recommendations. And he personally testified before Congress in support of the act. But he also used the spotlight that was trained on him to intervene individually on behalf of frustrated African-American citizens. This is the leadership of personal connection to which I referred earlier. And here's one example of many. During one hearing, the commission heard testimony about a New Orleans scheme in which white registrars struck some 2,000 registered African-Americans from the voting rolls. To re-register, these citizens were required to present two registered voters who would testify to their voting qualifications. Of course, there were no more registered African Americans to serve as witnesses, and no registered white person would vouch for a black voter. The person testifying about this scheme was an African American US Army captain who had lost the right to vote. Unable to provide registered witnesses, this man went to the local registrar with photo ID, his federal income tax return, his professional credentials in dentistry, and his honorable discharge from the army. And still he was turned away. Upon hearing this story during a televised hearing, Father Ted said, and I quote, 
Captain, I believe you, and I am sure that everyone who is watching this on television believes you. Go back to that registration place tomorrow morning. If they don't register you, call me immediately and let me know, because I will then call the President of the United States, and I will tell him that one of his Army officers is being prevented from voting in Louisiana. I can promise you that the President will make things so hot for everyone that they will wish they had never heard of you. It appears that the local voting registrar was watching TV that day. The next day, the Army captain was registered to vote immediately. In sum, I will say that it is certainly true that the Civil Rights Movement had many elements and many essential leaders. It is also true that Father Ted was one of them, providing moral and policy leadership on a broad scale and a deft personal touch. Further, it is clear that the work of racial justice is not yet done. And so I'll just conclude my comments by offering Father Ted's own words, which ring true today. One cannot hear about racial division and conclude that all is right in our land. The problems are more complicated today. The issues are not as clear. The solutions are not as readily apparent. But the crisis facing our country today is every bit as serious, if not more so. There are many more obstacles to be overcome before the dream of equality on which this country was founded is finally redeemed. All of us as Americans should be concerned and should look for answers that will help create a society where men and women can move about freely and people are not feared simply because they are strangers and where every human being is assumed to be a person of dignity and value and worth and respected as such. Thank you. Thanks to uh, each of the uh, uh, commentators here. I'll, I'll try and move briefly across a number of points and uh, perhaps if there are questions, folks might follow up. So uh, first to Jen McAward, uh, I am not saying that Father Hesburgh was not deeply committed to civil rights, but I am contesting a little her presentation of Father Ted's central importance. I see him as a second level figure. That's great, an important contribution. But it is notable, for those of you familiar with the history of the civil rights movement, you'd know Taylor Branch's three volumes, that great first volume, Parting the Waters, on the King Years, that uh, Father Ted's name is barely mentioned across the three volumes. In Robert Burke's study on Eisenhower Eisenhower and civil rights, Father Ted comes up as a member of the Civil Rights Commission. And I think Jen has a tendency to conflate Father Ted with the work of the Civil Rights Commission as a whole. But I could survey you here and ask you who was the chair of the Civil Rights Commission during the period from 57 to 68? Anyone know? You probably think it was Father Ted. But in fact, it was a man named John Hanna. He barely gets mentioned in the whole story, yet he is a more crucial figure on the Civil Rights Commission than Father Ted. This need for a sort of balance and a fair judgment about his legacy is crucial for a serious historian. Let me turn to Ken Woodward. Ken raised some points there. I think uh, occasionally might have missed my dry Australian sense of humor and uh, perhaps imputed uh, more meaning to some of the uh, so-called cheap shots. If ever I can take a cheap shot at the New York Times, I am going to take a cheap <laughs> shot at the New York Times. The paper's uh, gone in a weird direction. It doesn't produce all the news that's fit to print, I'm afraid. Uh, the Uriah Heapish comment I said Father Ted was leaning in that direction. Uh, do you ever know folks, usually, you know, if they're named a bishop or something like that, they go, oh, I wasn't expecting it at all. They came as a complete surprise. I'm so humble, etc., etc." Father Ted was likely to be named. He didn't need to go through the motions, in my view, but perhaps that's Australian straight talking there. Father Ted did have a vanity 
that needed nourishing. Everyone does. We all like to be praised, don't we? It's not a great thing. But here's a little vignette for you, Ken. Father Ted told me at one point, I'm sick of it. I'm, I'm no more honorary degrees. I've got the world record, etc. Then the bloody king of Thailand starts racking up honorary degrees and threatening Father Ted's record in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> Father Ted got back out on the circuit and started receiving honorary degrees again. Was it vanity? I suspect so. More to the point, the larger point Ken made about Father Ted and his association with the liberal establishment, because it was the liberal establishment. He was drawn into the web by a liberal Republican, Nelson Rockefeller, and he loved being part of it. Surely at some point, given the Rockefeller Foundation's enormous support for population control throughout the world, which I do discuss in the book, he might have said, hmm, I'm just not influencing them enough. Where was this influence, Ken, that he influenced them more than they influenced him? That's something I'd like you to expand. I'd like you to tell me where he influences Mac Bundy, Bob McNamara. Sad to say, he doesn't. He gets caught in their web. And it is, I regret to say, most obvious on the life issues. Imagine if Father Ted had committed to the life issues, what he committed to civil rights for African Americans. I suspect maybe the uh, debate in the United States might be slightly different. I'll leave aside the Commodore Hotel. I haven't stayed in that place. To Bill Kavanagh, I think I need to come up to DePaul for a really good conversation. Bill raises so many interesting points. He's such a great theologian and uh, raises questions. I, uh, I just finished teaching my foreign policy class and I go through the first term of the Reagan administration and the arms build up and the support in Central America and so on and so on. Uh, and all the critique that was mounted perhaps by undergrads like Bill back then. But one has to concede that Reagan, with an amazing leader, at long last he got one he could negotiate with, Mikhail Gorbachev, they negotiate significant arms limitation treaties. I have no particular brief for Reagan. I have a brief for trying to get the story right. And Reagan, in the end, did more for arms control than most of the people who were protesting him during his first term. Bill raises some crucial points about the nature of Catholic education and uh, how uh, our uh, quest, uh, Father Hesburgh's quest for excellence as defined by others, uh, has sort of sent us in difficult directions. Uh, but I am the first to say, that's uh, part of what I'm about, that Notre Dame has the best chance of any place to try and get it at least better. Uh, sadly, I think some nominally Catholic schools won't be that in another five or ten years. But Notre Dame will be. The broad Catholic culture of the school remains, helped along by its graduates, by its present students, by its amazing supporters who want the place to be a great Catholic university. We have work to do in that regard. I hope that my book will stimulate discussion about that work, that Father Ted brought us to a certain place, but there's much work to be done beyond that place. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll be glad to take questions.
Very much so, Abbott. Uh, the reality is that Father Ted, in some ways, is a case study of a phenomenon that uh, Ken's recent book talks about uh, to some degree of uh, this simulation that uh, Bill Kavanaugh was uh, addressing. And I titled the book American Priest because he was so deeply patriotic and loved the United States. He looked with suspicion, and rightly so, on some of the efforts on the part of the hierarchy. By the way, Bill, I'm not suggesting that the local bishop run Notre Dame. Let me uh, clarify that. Uh, but I do say that the school should see itself as part of the church, that, uh, that separation that Lando Lakes did. But Father Ted's desire for the place to be more acceptable in the United States on the terms of the secular academic elites, I think, led him. So there's a tension, if you will, in the title, American priest, and I try and work that out through the book, but it's very much an issue, Austin. Ken may want to say more. Well, you might be surprised how much Bill and I would agree on, on, um, on what Notre Dame could be and, and what it is. Um, I just want to mention two things in, in, with respect to what you're saying. First of all, you, you have to understand that the young people coming to Notre Dame changed, and their culture changed. Okay. Somebody up there doesn't like me, I can see. <laughs> Here's the Spitfire from the, uh, the 1980s, um, uh, and I'm thinking back to, uh, to the 50s. By the way, we protested Nixon when Ted brought him in 1955, I think. So we, we beat you by, the, uh, by a lot. No, the, the, the students changed. The families changed. We did a study of 50 years of our class. How many people sent their kids to Catholic school? Small percentage. The simulation rolled through the whole of society. So in a sense, it takes administrators, it takes professors, but it also takes students and the student the culture of those students changed, and there were no longer barriers separating Catholic kids from someplace else. That, that happened very early on. It was well in progress when I was there. Um, the other thing is that um, the other thing is that the synthesis, the, uh, the, the Catholic culture and so on. We read Christopher Dawson, we read Newman, we read all those people, but you know what? There were maybe 100 students out of 5,000 when I was there that got that kind of, uh, that kind of education. It was very small. The, the engineers didn't get it. God knows the business school didn't get it. They're getting more of it now than they did then. So I'm agreeing with you about now being rather better than when I was there. I'm glad I was there then. I'm glad we read Joseph Pieper and tons and tons of Maritan and so forth. But if I read Philip Gleason, the, the historian on this, um, uh, contending with... Kenny he loves my book, I must say. I just <laughs> work, work that in as a plug. <laughs> Not that Phil Gleason I talked to. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, I've got mine in writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was your professor, wasn't he? He was indeed. Professors are nice like that. That's true. <laughs> um, that the collapse was within neo-Thomism or neo-scholasticism itself. It wasn't a matter of switching from you know, one dean to, a, to another. It collapsed. I loved it. I had a language I could actually use. I could come to New York with Thomistic uh, arguments that nobody had heard before at, um, uh, at the schools that they were at. So I think that's the other change that took place. Well, I'm not sure what that adds up to, but let me let me let me make a point. And um, I didn't want to talk about it. It's a big book, and Ted did a lot of things. I only focused on the character thing. He knows we were very close to the man, and I respond to the way I did. However, 
When it comes to land or lakes, what's missing, Bill, in your book, as far as I am concerned, is the immediate goad for separation from the Holy Cross priest and separation um, from the institutional church. And that was 18 months of chaos in Catholic higher education, beginning with the unprecedented strike by faculty at the largest Catholic university at the time, St. John's in New York. 31 people fired for no particular reason. It carried over into the early stages of Catholic University and other kinds of places. There were three out of four professors were lay, but they had very little power. So what was sweeping was not just Jacqueline Brennan, who was kind of a nut, but, but as a matter of fact, um, um, all across the campuses, the high-handedness, especially on the part of religious orders, and uh, even though Ted said he was making these changes, you know, for the laity, I don't believe that for a moment. He really believed, and he also had a bad experience with that article by John Courtney Murray that the Vatican was clamping down on him. So he believed in in uh, in um, in in the uh, in, in the freedom that that was enunciated there. And um, you can argue either way about it, but I'm not so sure. Um, I know of any people in the hierarchy who are really good about education that uh, would have prevented him from, uh, from an error or, uh, one way or another. Could I just um, ask uh, Father Bill if he would say a little bit more about um, what exactly you think would the ideal governance situation be? I mean, you're, you're quite critical of the Land O'Lakes um, arrangement, but you don't really, and, and you kind of draw out what you think are the consequences, um, but you don't really spell out what you think um, the governance situation with regard to the uh, bishops or with regard to the Vatican or with regard to the religious orders uh, should be. And so you, you made it clear you don't want the local ordinary uh, intervening in, in Notre Dame's affairs. Um, could you spell that out a little bit? What what do you think ought the relationship be? Yeah, it's a matter to which I've given some considerable thought in sort of context other than writing the book in my involvement on uh, the whole issue of Catholic identity at Notre Dame, because, which I've been involved for 30 years and uh, which probably colors some of my thinking, of course, in the book. Uh, it uh, probably won't surprise uh, some of you, since I am a member of the religious order, that I think the founding religious order should retain its deep involvement in the university. And as such, that order is engaged with the church. We're an order in the church. So the Land O'Lakes statement that there would be no uh, kowtowing to any authority outside the academy while Notre Dame's obeying the NCAA and every other you know, financial f firm who puts bond rules on them and all the rest is, of course, complete nonsense. The only, the only entity that they really wanted to separate themselves off from, from their authority, was the church itself. Now, here is where, hopefully, there could have been a development with more thought I think they move far too quickly, but with more thought of, a, of an arrangement in which the bishops are not seen as the enemy of the university has sort of happened for a period of time. Bishops were kept at sort of arm's length. Uh, there's a slightly better uh, relationship now. It has to be done uh, in a careful way, but uh, the university should make it clear it's a catholic institution so whenever anyone enters that place there's no question about that identity i think the haziness about it has caused us uh, some problems with you get folks hired who have no interest or commitment to the mission of the place as a catholic school and of course we have examples like your own school as you mentioned of what takes place when that occurs. Whereas if the institutional connection is strong, primarily through the religious order, that's, that's where I'm saying the institutional uh, commitment must be, then there can't be any dispute about it. 
One of the difficulties with Father Ted and his powerful leadership is he essentially sidelined the order. The one person in the order who threatened Father Ted was Jim Birchall. Uh, and Birchall was aware of some of the challenges that Notre Dame was facing, and it's a sort of tragedy because of his personal flaws and sins uh, that he wasn't able to contribute because I think he had the brilliance to maybe have fashioned a different kind of working arrangement in which it wouldn't have been just the solo person making all the decisions. I mean, as Ken jokes, Father Ted always said, I'm turning over Notre Dame to lay control. In fact, he was turning it over to more of his control. That's, uh, as far as I know, he was not a lay person. Part, just one small comment on that. Part of the problem at DePaul is that it was uh, members of the religious order that were some of the most uh, uh, aggressive uh, proponents of secularization, and part of the problem now is that there aren't any Vincentians left, yeah. and so that's that we have our first lay president who, in some ways, uh, is kind of better on some of these issues than some of his uh, predecessors uh, who were Vincentians. Yeah, you raise a yeah. valid point: the sort of collapse of religious life and changes. In the Let me mention one thing quickly, and I don't mean to hog this thing, but something else that just occurred to me, which is that um, you celebrate my mentor, Frank O'Malley, and, and those who were like him back in, in the 50s. Frank was an English professor, uh, but he was into both intellectual and spiritual formation. Um, he, you should read his, uh, his, the material he wrote about forming the souls of his, of his uh, students. Um, that was unusual for its time, but not completely unusual. It's not something that you are taught in graduate school. And when you start getting PhDs, I'm sitting with three of them, I believe, um, you're getting a different animal altogether. I don't know where you would go today to find people who would dedicate themselves to the spiritual and, intel and bleed for it, and intellectual formation of their students. I, I am surprised, and I know Our Lady still cares for Notre Dame, because we can still recruit wonderful faculty who are committed to that. So I would say our theology department now, Bill, which you're familiar with, has a wonderful group of relatively young faculty who are deeply committed to not simply theology as a sort of intellectual discipline. They want to nourish the souls of their students. So it's a matter of recruiting the right people who want to buy in. Who want? Oh, sorry. It's a matter of recruiting the right people who want to buy in to the distinctive education we should be offering, which is both intellectual and spiritual formation, moral formation. Um, just one comment I would add uh, about the uh, secularization schools, uh, Catholic, Catholic universities, which is true of Notre Dame and others. Uh, uh, Ken mentioned, Ken mentioned the, the crises that happened with respect to academic freedom at St. John's and elsewhere. Uh, that was one driving force. Another was the, the, the freedom of movement that the schools wanted people like Father Ted wanted in, in not having to answer to the disorder. Another, though, was, which hasn't been mentioned, uh, which is really a driving force, especially for the Jesuit schools, was money. Um, they wanted access to the newly available uh, government funds. And that really isn't part of the narrative of your book, with respect to Notre Dame, because Ted was raising his own money. But, uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, Notre Dame managed to get access to very significant government monies without the, making the compromises that the Jesuits foolishly made. Well, and when they made, and when they made these changes, right, the suggestion was it would be temporary. And Look at the crisis. And when the crisis succeeded in the 70s, uh, later in the 70s, they didn't go back to the old form of government. Okay, with that, we're going to end our, uh, our, our panel discussion. I'm going to thank all of you.